I'm going to show a short Star Trek movie clip in the worship service tomorrow. And it's the final confrontation between Captain Kirk and the villain of the movie who's called Nero. When Kirk offers assistance to him and his ship, Nero's big concluding line is, I would rather die in agony than accept ex assistance from you. And of course, Kirk then says, fair enough, and fires all their weapons at the guy. And it's an interesting way to deal with the refusal of help. Amusingly enough, if you want to see the clip, you just go to YouTube and do what I did. Search for, I would rather die in agony. That's how I found it. Now, who is the person or people that you would rather go through, through a struggle than to accept their help? Can you, can you think of anyone or who would you rather die than accept their help? That's pretty messed up thinking, isn't it? And maybe that's too extreme. Maybe a gentler question would just be, who is the last person on earth you would go to for any kind of help? And that's the way we need to be thinking about this passage. It's found in Luke's gospel, and it's so familiar. It's the 10th chapter. It begins with verse 25. And in the New Revised Standard Version, we're told that it goes like this. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. In the narrative, it, it kind of is the culture. When, you're, when everything, when your government, religion, and culture are all the same thing, the lawyers are pretty important. They are the legal experts in the Mosaic law. Luke is a doctor, but his narrative, narrative here indicates that he might not be pro-lawyer. He makes it clear that this guy is not sincere in wanting to talk to Jesus. He's looking to find fault, to test Jesus out. His question is eternal, and it really showed the goal of so many faiths, an existence that outlasts what we know here. But the perspective that his question indicates that eternal life is somehow found in God, and he, though, seeks to earn it because he asks what he needs to do. He's looking for a roadmap to heaven. Jesus jumps into this dialogue with this man without hesitation and points the question back, but the lawyer has an answer. The Old Testament law says basically to love God with everything you've got and your neighbor is yourself. Two rules. Jesus affirms them in other places in the Gospels, and he didn't make them up. They're found way back in the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus doesn't create them in the Gospels, but he certainly lifts them up. But now this guy doesn't want to trick Jesus anymore. He wants to show his own righteousness, and he wants to do that through control. God gave these two rules that Jesus will say elsewhere, sum up everything in the law. This man wants parameters. He wants to rein this thing in. He wants to control God's law of love, keep it in its place. I'm called to love my neighbor. And that's a pretty short list. Because he's thinking, I, I probably don't really have that many. I, I like some distance in my neighborhood. I don't want the houses too close together. The answer that Jesus gives is such a problem 
Jesus gives a story that's probably too painful for this guy to hear. The traveler was beaten and robbed. Two people who would have been religious, would have been respectable to this fine lawyer, they move to the far side of the road and pass by. It's almost like they could say, we didn't even see him. We weren't that close. People will try to argue for their religious reasons to pass by, issues of purity, but they aren't the crucial element here. They see a person of their type and their faith injured, and they see helping as too risky, and they're not willing to chance it. Then Jesus makes this narrative, his little parable, as offensive as possible. In the Greek of the next sentence, Samaritan is the first word. I'm not sure we can get at how hard this was to hear for those who hear the words of Jesus. Samaritans, they were the enemy. They were the other. There's all kinds of history and just stuff here going back centuries. And I don't know... I don't know what we would insert for us to get the same level of shock. Would we say terrorist? Would we say Nazi? I'm I'm not even sure. There's so much animosity between these two groups of people. This is the guy that they would expect to go by quickly on the other side. This is the guy who wouldn't help, who wouldn't care, who wouldn't get involved, but he does. He just... He just helps, and he he gets involved. He goes on and on and on. He feels genuine pity. He cares for the guy himself. He carries him to an end, and he doesn't just drop him off. He stays and takes care of the guy personally, according to verse 34. When he has to go on, he leaves money for the bill, and he promises that he'll even come back later in case there's more expense. He takes all of the guy's problem on himself without hesitation. Jesus is talking to a guy who might be thinking himself that he would rather die in agony than take help from a Samaritan. He's a lawyer. He wants a religious contract with some clearly defined neighbor requirements and some limitations. Tell me who. Tell me how far my neighbor vicinity goes. Maybe, and his thinking, maybe, maybe it's my house of worship crowd. Maybe it's the people whose yards butt up against mine. Maybe it's the folks I went to school with and became friends with, or my relatives, or at least the good ones that I like. Jesus says basically, who chose to be a neighbor? Well, but, but that's not how this is supposed to work. That avoids the lawyer ability to work this thing around and narrow it down. The guy's not happy. He won't even say when he's asked the question at the end, the word Samaritan, because the word is is just as unclean to him as he thinks those people are. The neighbor, the one who showed mercy, chose to be a neighbor. Jesus says, go do that. Okay, copy that example. So the, the Samaritan is not only a hero of the story, he's the example given to the guy to follow. Go be like a Samaritan. And I'm sure that went over well later. When his friends ask, how did your talk with Jesus go? The last answer they expect is, Jesus said to go be like a Samaritan. To which they probably replied, so did he mean go be scum? The problem is, if you want to carefully manage your Christianity, if you want to keep it in its place, not let it interfere too much with your life, this parable isn't for you. You can't lawyer your way through what God is looking to do in the hearts of his people. I had a doctor once who went to law school. He told me that it was like learning a completely different way to think. He said it was like learning to hold up a sheet of black paper and then build a solid argument that that piece of paper was completely white. Jesus will not easily allow his disciples to do that with the word of God. I keep thinking of the Sesame Street song. These are the people in my neighborhood, in my neighborhood, in my neighborhood them and only them. Jesus says, no, who will you be a neighbor to? Who will you show love and compassion to? Who are you willing to care about? Don't play lawyer with any of this. This is supposed to be heart-shaping stuff that you have to think about, maybe for a long time. It's not, and it's not go looking for victims. It may be, though, when we pass by one, what are we going to do? When someone really and truly needs help, what are we going to do? What does it mean to have a heart like Jesus, to be like God? It means that we don't get to plan ahead for who we are and are not willing to help, who we will refuse to care about. If we plan that way, I fear we've already cut ourselves off from God. 
We don't get to ch- tell him which of his children have worth. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 2, this is from the Contemporary English Bible, God will be as hard on you as you are on others. He will treat you exactly as you treat them. So we should be terrified of deciding that someone has no value because this verse says we are inviting God to label us the same way. Maybe the heart of the lawyer realized that it's not that far to go from I'd rather die in agony than accept help from you to I'd rather die in agony than give you help. Our barriers are a problem. If we put ourselves in the place of the victim, are there people we would really rather stay messed up then let them help. And if we're honest, are there people we would want to go to the far side of the road and pretend not to see so we wouldn't have to get involved? Jesus wants us to be willing to surrender our barriers to him so that he might begin to tear them down. He will lead us to help in our lives, in our journey of discipleship. He will lead us to help some surprising people in some surprising situations. He will maybe put us in the position, too, of receiving help from some unexpected directions. I read something by a lady named Cynthia Jarvis who wrote this confusing idea. She said the lawyer thought that the law is God's grace. That means the law is the main thing. The rules are God's gift to us. And then we work it as God's manageable plan to get our way to him. She insists that for Jesus, God's grace, his mercy is the law. Those are two very different statements. And this isn't something we can reduce to a little moral and then say, go be nice to a stranger this week because that's too easy. This calls us to look in our hearts and see who we don't want to help and who we would not want to receive help from. Jesus said to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. I guess that breaks down if there are people we don't want to do good to us because we would rather they stay away. We won't help them because we wouldn't want them to help us. Wow, gold doesn't rust or tarnish, but that kind of tarnishes the golden rule a bit. When we think about passages like this, we don't come up with a cheap, moral, a little rule, we have to remember the words of the old chorus. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. What attitudes toward people in our heart keep us from being as close to God as we might and as close to living godly as we might like to live? Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. This parable shows us how dangerous, how potentially frightening those words truly are. But only if we're not willing to invite his grace to shape who we are and how we live. His grace is enough if we want it, if we accept it, and if we invite it. Can we pray together? God, give each of us the courage to invite your grace to shape and define who we are to change our hearts that we might be like you. God, if we're honest, there are people we feel so different and distant from. And there might be people we feel like, we might have put in these words, but we kind of feel like we'd rather die in agony than get involved with them or to get help from them. And maybe that becomes the point at which we realize we would be slow to help them. God, we're not looking to leave here with some little saying for the week or some little guideline or something like that. We're hoping to find or to take a step toward having our hearts changed. God, work to help us see the barriers between us and others, the attitudes that have built up, the prejudices that have taken root, the separation that has grown, and work to remove barriers, to heal distance, to change our attitudes, and to open our eyes and our hearts to see the people around us who are your children, whom you love. Help us to realize we don't want to label anyone worthless because we would never want you to see us that way. Help us to be like you. Help us to be like your son. And help us to realize we can't do it on our own. We only do it as your grace shapes and changes who we are. Help us to see that, invite it, do it in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to end with a few verses from Psalm 82, verses 3 through 5, and make that our blessing for this week. 
It's kind of unusual, but I think it goes with the other passage. The psalmist writes, Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. To make that our blessing for this week. May you find your neighborly spirit taking expression in standing up for those who have been left out. May you feel the Holy Spirit's leading you to get involved in the lives of those who most need to experience Christ's love. And finally, may you find your way for sharing Jesus through words and actions with those who have no understanding or experience of his grace.